Welcome back. You're watching The World This Week with us, Vivian Waltz of Time Magazine. Nice to see you again. Say hello again to Paul Taylor, Europe editor for the Reuters News Agency, George Kozolius, mm -hmm. senior producer at partner station AITV, and uh, Claude Guibal of uh, Radio France. Welcome back uh, to all of you. We were talking before the break about Europe. Lately, um, we've seen in, over in the UK the Labour opposition making more emboldened pronouncements in favour of the EU, but a plan by the ruling coalition's junior partners, the Liberal Democrats, to uh, spread uh, some of that Europhilia around with televised debates that feature its leader against the standard bearer of the Eurosceptic Euro UKIP party. Well, according to polls, um, that's been a bit of a failure. Nick Clegg taking a bruising in two debates with Nigel Farage. This country, Nick, has had enough of getting involved in endless foreign wars. But these are, whether it's, whether these are it's dangerous. You, whether it's you doing it or anybody else doing these it. Are... And there is no evidence. Hang on. Hang on. There is no evidence that our military intervention in these countries is making life better. As that's I say, not, that's with you not as Deputy Charles Prime Minister, asked. that's not the with question. With you as Deputy Prime Minister, we bombed Libya, and it's worse now than no, it was it, then. And the answer to Charles's question is, I don't want to be part of a European foreign policy. Paul, he seems to be having trouble there, Nick Clegg, getting a word in. Yes, uh, it's very hard to get a word in with Nigel Farage. He's, he is a very impressive public speaker. He is a smart guy. He knows uh, the electorate well, I think. He has a real feel for it. But I think that actually, you know, you picked a moment where uh, uh, Clegg was particularly uh, poor and on the defensive. I think the fact that there is real, genuine public debate about Europe in Britain is a step forward. Because what we've had is sort of no debate about Europe. We've had endless scare stories about Europe. But actually, the pro-Europeans in the UK have been afraid, for whatever reason, electoral or because of the popular press that was against them, to come out and show their colours. And you're seeing that now in the Labour Party. You're seeing it also with the Liberal Democrats. And for the Liberal Democrats, they're in such dire straits in the polls anyway, as Mr. Cameron's junior partners in government, that it probably makes sense for them to go into this kind of debate, even if they get defeated, because at least people see Nick Clegg out there uh, uh, debating and so on. And he will have uh, won at least some of the support of those people in the UK who are sort of a, probably not a majority, but a silent minority in any way, who actually support you, Britain staying in the European Union. Are things changing or is the momentum still very much with the Eurosceptics, be they the backbenchers of the Conservatives or Nigel Farage's UKIP? I think things are changing slightly. Um, first of all, I think that, that, that UKIP will do very strongly in the European Parliament elections. They may come first. They will almost certainly, if they don't come first, come second, just behind Labour and ahead of the governing Conservative Party. Uh, then the question is, is that the high watermark? Because two things have happened. First of all, the Labour Party has had the courage, some would say the political folly, to say we, we're not going to have a referendum on Europe unless there's another transfer of power required from the UK to Brussels. As long as we go on with the same treaties, we don't need a referendum. Yes, we'll try and renegotiate things over time. So, so if Labour win the election or if Labour and the Liberal Democrats win the election together, there will be no referendum. If the Conservatives, the Conservatives have to win the election on their own for there to be a referendum. And now Prime Minister Cameron has come out with a list of what he wants to change in Europe, which is rather more modest and rather more realistic than a lot of what his backbenchers uh, in Parliament and a lot of what UKIP would want to change. So probably the, the odds are changing in favour of Britain staying in, but it's not over yet. Vivian Waltz, when you think back to last week, the Eurosceptics here in France in local elections, well, they were the far right, the National Front. Absolutely. What do you think of what's going on over in Britain? Well, I think that, you know, it's the same, so it's the same undercurrent, obviously, between um, the Front National in, in France and UKIP in Britain, um, although they are two very different beasts. But nonetheless, they have tapped into... What is certainly a genuine feeling among many, many people that they are disconnected from the political process and that there is this, this thing in Brussels, this very, very um, complicated, complex machinery that they don't un understand necessarily and that is even one step more removed from their lives. Um, and that is having an extremely direct effect on their life nonetheless. 
Um, so I think that, you know, normally we kind of ignore EU elections, more or less. Um, they're, they, they usually not, they, they usually don't make huge news. Um, and this year is very different. Um, and very much so, I think, because these, you know, ultra conservative far right parties um, have grabbed an issue that is very popular and widespread in, in Europe, I'm sure not just Britain and France. Well, the alternative for Deutschland in, um, in Germany is going, well, their first time last uh, fall, and they almost got into Parliament. They were just formed in April, and uh, there are a lot of Euros, Euro, I mean, Euro money septics in, uh, in Germany. So I expect them to do uh, pr pretty well as well in the European elections. And the other thing about these European elections, just like last Sunday, is it opens the door to legitimacy for people who uh, were shirked in the past. I mean, you know, a lot of people now see the National Front as a, in France as a legitimate party. And there is a perception. I mean, you know, we can talk quantitative easing and deflation or lowflation, all these complicated words. But you tell somebody in 2000, they paid one franc, 10 centimes for a coffee in the bistro. Today, they're paying the equivalent of eight francs. That's what gets over to people. And that's what wins elections. And that's what uh, people like Ukip or the National Front in France are doing. Uh, there's another interesting twist on this story. M Nigel Farage, the head of uh, UKIP, interviewed uh, for the UK edition of GQ magazine, was asked his favorite leader, and he answered, Vladimir Putin. I love the way he handled the whole Syria thing. I don't like him, I wouldn't trust him, and I wouldn't want to live in his country. But compared with the kids who run foreign policy in this country, I have more respect for him than our lot. Paul Taylor. Well, this is, you know, the th it would be interesting to see whether this has any impact on the voters or not. Um, all, one of the things you find that they have in common, the far right around Europe and the, far, and the extreme left, have both found ways of blaming what happened in Ukraine and in Crimea on Europe rather than blaming it on President Putin. Uh, of saying, uh, for example, as Farage did and Marine Le Pen did, it's Europe's fault. They raised... Uh, expectations, they created hopes in Ukraine that they were going to be members of the European Union, and that led them to rise up and overthrow their government, and that provoked President Putin into intervening. Um, uh, Marine Le Pen has said that, uh, Farage has gone further and said that the EU has blood on its hands. Newt Gingrich said it. So, there, you know, there, 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 there is a view there. The question is, will that hurt, help them or harm them at the polls? Because um, there's a tendency in times of crisis for people to rally around their government rather than to rally around the person who is perceived to be causing the crisis. So um, it may be that that doesn't uh, favor them, but uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's an open question. I don't, I don't think foreign poli I don't think that kind I mean, of foreign policy is going to play in the European right. elections in May. I think it's going to come, it, like Clinton said, it's the economy, stupid, and that's what it's going to come down to. And people, people are going to, you know, relate to Brussels as as the bad guy and open immigration as as the source of problem, and that's how they're going to vote. All right, you say that, but on Thursday we got news and images, courtesy of Russian television, of the head of Gazprom reporting to Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev. There you see them sitting down telling he was raising rates for the second time in three days for Ukraine, and they would go up another 26% before the end of the month. Uh, will Russia be a, an issue for the European elections, Vivian Walt? I cannot imagine. I, I, I agree with George. It, it seems rather remote um, that, uh, that this would necessarily be an issue, perhaps in Germany, which is obviously directly affected by what happens in Russia and has enormous, um, enormously important trade relationships and so on, um, but I cannot imagine. Um, however, you know, the whole issue of Ukraine, I mean, there is actually something to be said for the way that the EU um, did not handle the Ukraine crisis particularly, um, you know, sophisticatedly and, um, and didn't seem to um, sort of see what was down the road with, with Russia. Um, and uh, and appear to be kind of caught on the back foot um, when uh, um, when Russia clearly you know made its move very swiftly. And, so, but, and Paul Taylor, final point on this: uh, Do you see things escalating or de-escalating between now and those European uh, elections? The sixty-four thousand euro question. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I don't think they're going. To, it's going to de-escalate very much. I can't see that. 
I, I find it hard to imagine that the Russians are going to go in further into Ukraine militarily uh, because then they would suffer really severe economic damage. And the economic uh, 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 levers are beginning to hurt them, I think. But um, on the other hand, I think they have every interest in continuing to try and destabilize Ukraine, uh, in trying to discredit, if they can, the Ukrainian election due, coming up in May and so on. So for all those reasons, I can't see it getting easier anytime soon. All right. Let's hope they don't need too much natural gas then between now uh, and those. Well, the Russians need to sell their gas too. Yeah. You know, you they can't eat it. All right. We're, we're gonna we're continue to follow that story. We're gonna switch continents now. The news upstaging the conclusion in Brussels of an EU Africa summit on Thursday. Chad, whose peacekeepers are accused of firing into the crowd last week in Centrafrique's capital, killing at least thirty withdrawing its forces from the Central African Republic. This at a time when the international community is struggling to come up with the needed manpower to stop ethnic and religious killing in that former French colony. Chad, who uh, many in the Christian South perceive as part of the problem. They say it's the rear guard for the rebels who took the capital last year. Of course, N'Djamena sees it differently. We've been saying for several months that there has been a wanton and malicious campaign against Chad and its soldiers. And even the Chadian people living in the Central African Republic have paid the price. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of Chadians have been killed. Claude Guibal, you're just back from the Central African Republic. Is Chad part of the problem or part of the solution? Both. Um, Chad is obviously a part of the problem. I mean, Chad is a key player in Central Centrafric for years and years. I mean, um, Chad was the one behind um, the, the former president, uh, from uh, Ange Felix Patassé to uh, François Bozizet and then Michel Zotodia. And, uh, you know, yesterday I was talking to people in Bangui. They feel relieved that the Chadian soldiers were leaving, uh, were pulling out from from Central Africa, but um, it's not the end of the story. You know, Chad is not going to leave a, a vacuum in 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 in, uh, in Central Africa. Central Africa is a is a courtyard of of Chad. Many of I mean, Central African think that Chad has um, um, has used Seleka to 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 invade legally. Um, Central Africa, you know, with, those, with those you, northern militias that took the capital last year. The northern militias, um, mainly Muslim militias, but um, they are um, with, with them are um, Chadian um, um, mercenaries and and, um, so and Sudanese nice. mercenaries as well. And um, s s you know, when, when the when the Chadian soldiers of Miska were, um, I mean, the, 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 the Chadian contingent of Miska. Uh, was in Bangui, you know, people were afraid of them, you know, most of the people, you know, they have a nickname in, in Bangui, they call them uh, Don La Mort. Uh, give death. Give death, you know. Uh, they, the, the Chadians were suspected of, um, of um, connivance or... Um, con con connivance. Uh, connivance yeah. with, the, with, the, with the Seleka leaders, with the Seleka rebels, and uh, they were seen as the protectors of the Muslims only. And they were also patrolling this part of the north near the Chadian border, where they're still there, I suppose, because they're withdrawing now. Uh, is that is is that going to be a tougher assignment there? Well, actually, they were controlling the north as Cameroon troops were controlling the border with Cameroon. You know, every country part of the Miska was controlling uh, his neighboring border. Uh, but there's going to be there's going to be a problem because now they're pulling back. But the, the, the Central African Republic is mainly well is basically divided now. You know, you had the the west of the country, uh, which is controlled by um, the anti balakas militias, uh, and you have the east and the north of the country where the Seleka are still, and you have. Um, movement of um, rebel groups and armed groups in the north of uh, Chad, which are quite uh, threatening, and those groups are heavily armed, you know, and many things they are armed by, 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 by Chad. So a lot of people now are afraid that uh, the war in Central African Republic is taking a new stage, and 
much worse than what happened before. Well, the nice thing about the Chadians leaving Chad, uh, leaving the Central African Republic is now Miska troops won't be shooting at each other anymore. Uh, the, you know, uh, so it'll be pretty clear. But I, I, I agree. I mean, how can you be part of the solution and yet be the problem since well, since Potasse was overthrown uh, by Bo uh, Bozizé in 2002? You know, it's just not possible. But you won't solve anything in Central African Republic without Chad anyway. Yeah, I mean, wasn't there sort of a division of labor between the French and the Chadian? Yeah, when the, when the crisis occurred, actually yeah. at the big at the very beginning, uh, France has left um, the, the 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 management of this crisis to Chad and first to South Africa yeah. as well, but then to Chad. And but what happened after a year of uh, Seleka in 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 Central African Republic was a year of um, alleged torture and murders, exactions. Uh, it went too far, you know, it went too far. And then and all this, by the way, was going on while the Chadians were being praised for their valorous combat in Mali. They were alongside the French pushing mm -hmm. out Islamists there. Yeah, well, the, the, the problem of, uh, of France is obviously Chad, because Chad is our main ally in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. You know, it, its role mm. is, is a key role, essential role in, in Mali. And um, and in in Central African Republic as well, because Chadian soldiers were the biggest uh, contributors to to the Miska, um, 800 men and well trained men. You know, Miska without the Chadian is almost useless. Um, at the mo very moment when France is seeking help, you know, seeking for more troops. Um, Chad is, 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 is shutting the door, and that's very bad news for, for Paris. Vivian Walt, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda, and yet, as we've just heard, the international <coughs> community struggling to come up with the needed peacekeepers to stop people from killing each uh, other. You know, you, you read the statements by Ban Ki-moon and, you know, the, the plans for the UN to supposedly put together a pretty tiny peacekeeping force, which they say might take six months for them to deploy. Um, it's it's kind of mind-boggling because, you know, yes, it's a very important market. 20 years after Rwanda, Rwanda was the point at which everybody said this will never happen again and never happen again, never, ever, ever. And um, you put together a policy of, of responsibility to protect, whereas surely, you know, this is a classic case in which there should be some kind of international intervention if you're really going to stick to that principle. At the outset of that EU-Africa summit, Paul Taylor, praise all around the fact that there were 1,000 European Union peacekeepers that were been pledged. We don't know whether there'll actually be 1,000 uh, showing up. How, how, how does that work? Well, the, the, you know, the, if you look at it from the European end of the telescope, which may be the, the wrong end of the telescope to look at it <laughs> from in terms of effectiveness, um, Europeans are uh, in economic difficulties. They've mostly had to cut their defense spending. They now have worrisome developments in uh, the Black Sea region with Russia, as we've talked about, uh, in Crimea, and the worry about will the Russian forces go further and so on. They have the, the NATO members who are European Union members in the Baltic states, uh, in Poland, asking for more NATO allied European also military presence there to reassure them that they are safe from the Russians and so on. So all of a sudden, uh, Central Africa looks further away than it did a few months ago, I think. And there's also ago. a problem in the French speech. You have a double speech. French Sangaris troops are yeah. saying... Sangaris, the name of the operation. It's the name yeah. of the French military operation in, in, in uh, Central <clears throat> African Republic. They say, OK, it's fine. Level of violence has decreased. Of course, it has decreased if you compare it to December. Mm. Why? Has it decreased because you have no more Muslims, you have no more targets. Mm -hmm. I mean, so technically it has decreased, and saying so, they, the message is okay. We are managing. No, the huge. I mean, there is an emergency. This country is dying. The situation is appalling. People are starving. You can. It's amazing. Whenever you go in Bangui or outside Bangui, you see kids with red hair, big bellies. Malnutrition is, is reaching. A climax, you know, and by the end of the month, the rainy season is starting. Then you will have the harvest, but there will be no harvest. There, there are no seeds anymore in Central African Republic because the seeds have been eaten or destroyed. 
uh, you have a million of people outside Central Africa. You know, they are um, one out of four people have fled their houses. The economic um, structure of the country is destroyed because the Muslims were the one who hold the economic reins of the country. They were. Um, I, I was going to ask you about that uh, because we're hearing two stories. One is that the Muslims were attacked because of rivalry, long-standing rivalries. And the other story we're hearing is that the Muslims were attacked because they're the shopkeepers and people want to get what's in the shops. The Muslims are attacked because the Seleka for a year has, uh, has uh, perpetrated exactions and murders. But before that, I mean, it's, it's really weird when you talk, and you were talking about Rwanda, uh, when you talk to people, they say, no, but before we used to live together happily, mm. there, there were no problems. So how come people had two names? How come Michel Jotodia, who was a Muslim, was a Muslim has, to be, has to choose a Christian name? Because it was easier for Muslims to have a Christian name whenever you need it because of administrative procedures, you know. Uh, you had... I mean, citizens were not treated equally, but it's true that the Muslim had... The economic power, they had the money, they had the shops, they, they were the carriers, they were also the, the breeders, you know, the pearl mm. uh, nomadic tribes are the one uh, mm. with, uh, with the cattle. And now they're gone. Now they're gone. That cool. means that you have no meat anymore, you have no shops, you have no cash, you have no money. There's no money at all in Central African Republic, in the States, in the, there's no money. Let, let's take a look at some of the pictures that you took when you were there, just very briefly, uh, that you brought back with us. Um, can you tell us, we're going to show the first one here, uh, of uh, two young men. Uh, can you tell us what's written on that sign? Uh, no to Miska, Chadian Miska, and Burundi's Miska, and the Randi's Bastards. <laughs> That's All what right. I can say. Uh, this picture was taken in PK5, uh, PK which is a, a Muslim enclave of, uh, of uh, Bangui. Um, but you have Christians there, and they don't want to see the, the Miska soldiers because they said the Miska was not doing anything to prevent insecurity. I mean, insecu and you, you also spoke to uh, to um, young militiamen from the other side, from the Seleka side. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I spoke to uh, I spoke to rebels, of, I mean, soldiers of the Seleka, which were confined, uh, waiting for um, you know disarmament, uh, but. When I when I went to uh, and this picture is not a Seleka fighter uh, fighter but an anti Baleka fighter. Those are the Christian militias. The Christian militias. The, this guy, the guy you can see, told me that he wanted to kill every single Muslim in the Central African Republic uh, because they were the one to blame for everything. Uh, and the anti Balekas. Now it's really confusing when you are on the field because you don't know who's who. You know you. You had the historical anti-Balakas who were militias um, um, created to, to fight. At the beginning, initially, they were created to fight uh, the, the um, road bandits, and they were supported by President Bozizé. And now this, um, you have also a fake anti-Balakas, you, know, um, you know, like band real bandits mm. um, and, and, and uh, looters. And you don't know who's who, you know, when you are in PK5, it happened to me one day, we were under fire for five or six hours without any intervention from the militaries. And we were among the population, there were shots and there were grenades and you don't know who was firing. Uh, some people say, well, they were the, these are the anti-Balakas who come here to kill us because we are Muslims, but you don't know if it's not looters who are coming there to to force people to flee the house and then to, 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 to stall and destroy everything. You don't know who's behind. Vivian Wall, it's going to be a long while. I, and that's exactly what I was just thinking. When you hear the descriptions of a, what is essentially the, the fabric of, a, of an entire society um, has just fallen apart and you have a million people now outside of their homes, apparently completely empty villages, um, I, it just seems like it's going to be generations before you can actually rebuild. You have to rebuild a country. I think you have to build because there is no, there were there was nothing before. Right. I mean, it was not even a state. You have one road. 
you have one road to... Uh, it's a story, of course, we'll continue to follow. We're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Claude Guibal, I want to thank you. I want to thank Paul Taylor for being with us, George Kazilius, Vivian Walt. Thank you for joining us here in The World This Week. Oh, we didn't want to go back to the smoke.